Many thanks for the invitation. It has been a pleasure listening to all of these fascinating accounts of human behavior. And I'll just start this talk with a quote uh, from a Frenchman, one of my favorites. Um, Blaise Pascal wrote, what a chimera is man, what a novelty, a monster, a chaos, a contradiction, a prodigy. Judge of all things, an imbecile worm, depository of truth, and sewer of error and doubt, the glory and scum of the universe. And I think we're all here because we're trying to understand how is it that humans are capable of both heroism and atrocity. And today I'll share with you some work that I've been doing with colleagues at University College London over the past several years to try and develop ways we can study in the lab a much uh, more tractable, tra tractable version of the kinds of dilemmas uh, that we've heard about throughout this workshop. Now, the traditional view of moral behavior, moral decision making, is that morality and, and pro-social behavior involves an override of self-interest that is representative in, in more primitive parts of the brain, and moral rules and pro-social actions are represented in higher cognitive areas, and these put the brakes, so to speak, on these impulses. So antisocial behavior has traditionally been understood as a failure of this braking system. But more recently, folks like Josh Buchholz have argued that this sort of dual systems model is overly simplistic. And instead, we should be thinking about moral decision-making and pro-social behavior within a, within a framework of value-based decision-making. And that's the perspective that I'll take uh, in my work uh, that I'll present today. So broadly speaking, this framework conceptualizes decision-making as a number of computationally distinct processes that are body embodied in separable brain areas. So when we make decisions, we have to represent the different options. We have to assign values to those options. Uh, we have to select actions that lead to the desired outcomes, represent those outcomes, and then update our representations uh, so that we can make better decisions in the future. And over the past 20 years or so, uh, neuroscience has amassed tons and tons of data um, that highlights a common decision-making circuitry in the brain that includes the striatum and the medial prefrontal cortex um, in many of these computations, and furthermore, that abstract beliefs and goals are represented in more lateral prefrontal areas, um, and, and these can modulate value representations within this circuitry. So uh, today I'll present some research studies that focus on a few questions. First of all, is value representation in the brain sensitive to moral rules, to moral goals? If so, how does the brain represent those moral rules? And finally, how is it that moral rules then come to shape value representations in the brain? So to answer these questions, um, we needed to develop a paradigm to study moral decision-making in the laboratory. And so I developed this over the past several years with my colleagues at UCL. And our paradigm was very much inspired by Tanya Singer's work, also carried out at UCL uh, about a decade earlier. And in these experiments, we bring people into the lab and they have to make decisions. Um, and they're fairly simple decisions. They're deciding uh, whether they're willing to inflict pain in order to earn some money for themselves. And the pain is sometimes delivered to themselves, but sometimes delivered to another person that they don't know. Um, essentially, what we're, we're asking then is how much profit are you willing to accept in order to inflict pain on another person? And just like in Tanya's studies, um, the pain is in the form of electric shocks. Um, so they're very unpleasant stimuli, but they don't do any physical damage. Um, so they're within the limits of what we can do ethically within the lab. But people are, importantly, uh, willing to pay sometimes significant amounts of money to avoid getting these shocks. And so what we do in these experiments is compare how much profit people require to accept these shocks for themselves, and we compare that to how much money they have to be paid to hurt another person, a stranger that they've never met, they're never going to meet. 
So the way that this works is we bring two participants into the lab um, for an experimental session. Um, they arrive at slightly different times and they're led to different rooms so they don't see or interact with one another. Um, and then we, we use an electric stimulation device uh, to deliver uh, shock stimuli to the wrist. Um, and we, we do a pain thresholding procedure to make sure that every person, first of all, doesn't get shocks above a level that they're comfortable with. But secondly, that we can match the subjective unpleasantness of these stimuli across participants. So we use the thresholding uh, where we start at a very, very low level and then gradually increase it until the participant tells us that they don't want to take anymore. And then we use that threshold to create an individually tailored shock stimulus that we'll then use um, throughout the rest of the experiment. Um, I'm, I'm guessing there will be questions about this paradigm throughout, um, or are you having trouble, trouble hearing me? Ah, um, so we tell them uh, that they should, they should uh, tell us when the level of the pain is um, the maximum that they're willing to tolerate in the experiment. Okay, so after this thresholding procedure, um, we then randomly assign the two participants to the roles of decider and receiver. And these roles are gonna remain throughout the whole study, so one person is the decider, and they're gonna be making a series of decisions um, that look like this. Um, so it's between different amounts of shocks and different amounts of money. So for example, seven shocks for 10 pounds or 10 shocks for 15 pounds. And they decide which of these two options they prefer. And crucially, uh, the money is always for the decider, but half the time, the shocks are also for the decider, and the other half the time, the shocks are for the receiver, for the other person. Um, so we're, we're, we're asking people across a number of trials um, to make choices between different amounts of money and pain. Money is always for the self, but the pain can be either for the self or for the other. And there are a few features of this paradigm that we thought really hard about because what we're really interested in measuring is what is the value of the money um, when it comes from harming oneself versus another person. Um, so first of all, we have to give our participants a number of different options with different amounts of money and pain so we can really compute an exchange rate for the money versus pain across these different settings. Um, so our participants make about 150 choices and only one is going to be randomly selected and implemented. And this is common knowledge for the participants, um, so they're aware that any one of their choices um, will be implemented for real. They'll get the money, and either they or the other participant will get the pain. And so we're really incentivizing these choices, and so participants behave um, in a pro-social way. If they choose to give up money to help uh, the receiver, for example, this is genuine, um, genuine concern or genuine moral behavior and not just, say, posturing or wanting to appear nice in front of other people. Um, on that note, we also make the decisions private and confidential with respect to both all the experimenters as well as the receiver. So we don't want any concerns about reputation um, or fear of punishment to pollute the decisions that people are making. We are really interested in uh, the moral decision-making process when choices are unobserved. Um, conscience, what is it that makes people do the right or the selfish thing um, when no one else is watching and no one can find out the outcome of their decision? Um, finally, the roles are fixed um, and identities are totally anonymous. So again, um, there are not going to be any concerns about reciprocity, that the other person might find out what you did and then uh, take that out on you later. And uh, finally, we, we recruited in our studies um, participants who are relatively naive to these kinds of studies. Um, so we exclude participants who have studied economics or psychology, who may have, for example, heard of the Milgram experiments that on the surface are, are somewhat similar to these. Um, no one who has experienced uh, shocks before. So for example, if they had been in Tanya's study before, we would not let them be in our study. Um, also, no experience with any studies involving social interaction. So one, one thing that we're concerned about, of course, is do people actually believe that there's another person who might get these shocks? And, um, and, and are we actually going to administer the shocks at the end? And so in addition to recruiting participants who we think will believe us that this is, in fact, going to be a, a real set of, of choices that are actually implemented, um, 
We also asked them at the end in a very carefully designed exit questionnaire whether they believe the setup, and indeed the majority of our participants do believe uh, the, the credibility of, of, of what we say that we do. And of course, we don't use any deception in these studies, so we do actually select one choice and implement it at the end. After our participants make a series of choices um, in this task, we want, to, uh, we want to build a model, a mathematical model, of how they make these decisions, because this is going to allow us to measure very precisely their preferences and also link these preferences to uh, value-based decision-making and how it's represented in the brain. Um, so just conceptually, what we're doing is uh, each trial has a helpful option and a harmful option. Um, and we can imagine that each of these options has a uh, subjective value, which we'll call V. And um, we can model the probability of, of uh, choosing, um, of, of switching from one option to the other as a function of the difference in value between those options. And that value difference is gonna depend on a number of factors. Uh, for example, the amounts of money at stake, the amounts of pain at stake, and whether the pain is for self and other. And so what we do is we take the full set of participants' choices and we can write down a number of different equations that um, treat these terms differently. So one model um, might say, oh, just pick the option that has the most money and don't worry about the pain. Um, another model might say, oh, just go for the, op the option that has the least amount of pain and don't worry about the money. Another model might actually consider both the money and the pain trade them off according to an exchange rate, and still other models might treat pain for self and others either the same or differently. And so what we do in our data analysis is we sort of write down uh, the, the uh, reasonable space of how people might weigh up these different sources of value, and then we find the model that best describes the pattern of choices that participants make in the experiment. And I'll show you the, the class of models that does the best at predi pr predicting participants' choices. And these models do very, very well. They predict, on average, about 90% of participants' choices. It's a very simple model. It just says that um, the difference in value between the two options depends on the difference in money between the, to the two options, or delta M, the difference in shocks between the two options, or delta S, um, and then the money and the shocks get, uh, get weighed up by a, a parameter called kappa, which we call harm aversion. Um, and harm aversion really captures the exchange rate between money and pain, um, or, or really the, the subjective cost of pain. And, and kappa takes on different values, um, whether the pain is for self and other. And just to give you an idea of what this value represents, um, Kappa can go from zero to one, um, and as it approaches one, um, this is plotted against um, how much money people have to be paid to accept an additional shock. So as harm aversion approaches one, people become very, very harm averse, and they're requiring upwards of 20 pounds per shock to increase it. Um, as it goes towards zero, then people care really about maximizing their profits, and they're willing to accept increasing amounts of pain in order to increase their profits even by just a little bit. To give you a sense of the range of preferences that we observe in our studies, which are conducted with young adults recruited in London and Oxford, many, although not uh, many, but not all of them are, are university students. Um, we have participants who uh, refuse to deliver a single shock to another person, um, even for a profit of 20 pounds. And at the other end of the spectrum, we have people who are willing to uh, deliver 20 additional shocks to the other person uh, for a profit of 10p. And these shocks feel a little bit like a, a wasp sting that lasts for half a second or running your hands under really hot water. So they're quite unpleasant. And um, we didn't actually try to measure in these experiments whether anyone would pay to deliver shocks to another person. But I suspect that if we did the kinds of manipulations that Tanya has done, um, then we would observe this kind of schadenfreude. OK, so we find in our model comparisons that um, harm aversion, 
takes on a different value when the pain is for self versus other. But the question, of course, is what direction does that go? And so we can come up with a couple of pr uh, different predictions based on um, the broader literature as well as um, moral philosophy uh, perspectives on, on, on moral behavior. Um, so from the perspective of, of economics and even behavioral economics, which over the last 10, 20 years has demonstrated that, that humans do have social preferences, they do care about the outcomes of others. But um, the hundreds of studies that have looked at the way people compare money for self versus money for others shows that even though people are willing to be generous and they do value the outcomes of others um, more than nothing, um, they still predominantly care more about their own outcomes. So in the classic dictator game, when you give someone some money and they can share it with another person, the majority of people will will uh, keep more than half for themselves. And so this, predict, uh, pr this perspective predicts that um, perhaps, um, although people will be harm averse for others, they will not inflict pain on others for nothing. Um, they still should require more compensation to harm themselves than to harm someone else. But if we factor in the work on empathy, the work on moral preferences, perspectives from uh, philosophers like Adam Smith, for example, um, these perspectives um, predict that there may be something additionally aversive or costly about benefiting from another's mit misfortune. And this reduction in value could then increase the amount that people have to be paid to sort of make up for that, to inflict pain on the other person. So what we find across uh, many studies now, um, and I'll show you the results from the first two, is a, a very reliable and consistent uh, effect where harm aversion is greater uh, for others' pain than for own pain. So people require more money to inflict pain on another person, on a stranger, um, than they require to inflict the same amount of pain uh, for themselves. Um, so this is in, in our first study. Um, in our second study, this is uh, the harm aversion um, parameter I, I've translated into uh, pounds per shock. Um, we use very different methods for eliciting these choices in our first two studies, but the effect is very consistent. So um, wh what I'll talk about for a lot of the rest of the talk is a, a, dif a, a different score between these two, which I'll call moral preference. Um, so if we just take t harm aversion for others um, and s subtract from it um, harm aversion for self, then this is what the distribution in the population looks like. Very consistent pattern. Um, these participants now are ordered from uh, the participant with the least moral preference to the most moral preference. So this person here um, really doesn't mind shocking themselves for money, but is very averse to shocking the other person for money. Um, whereas this, uh, the folks down at this end of the spectrum are actually uh, more willing to profit from another person's pain than from their own, from their own pain. So just a couple things to notice from these distributions. First, that the majority of participants, it's usually about two-thirds, the, the blue guys, um, they show what we'll call moral preference, so they find it more aversive to harm the other person than themselves. Um, and secondly, if you look at just sort of the, the range uh, in the upward direction, it's a lot higher than the range in the downward direction on average. So um, that was the start, the jumping off point really for our research. And um, we wanted to then understand, well, what are the neural mechanisms supporting this behavior? And there are of course two um, possible sort of low level explanations for why we see this preference that stem from uh, cognitive and um, by, by extension neural representations of um, rewards and, and punishments. Um, so, one possibility, which I hinted at earlier, is that the money you get from doing something immoral is somehow less valuable. Uh, it's, it's activating uh, value-sensitive regions in the brain less than, um, than the same rewards gained in, in an honest way. Um, but of course, we haven't ruled out an alternative possibility, um, which is that maybe um, in this decision context, uh, representations of others' pain are stronger than representations of, of our own pain. And of course, behavior that we're observing in these experiments is a trade-off between these two quantities. So if we see a difference, we don't know um, if it's the, the money you get from, from harming someone else is worth less, or if the, the pain of the other person is, is more aversive um, in these choices. And 
to address the second question, there have been a few behavioral experiments looking at how people uh, exchange pain with other people. So um, these are uh, different ways of representing results of dictator games that have been uh, conducted with pain. Um, so it's a less fun kind of dictator game to be a part of. Uh, the experimenter will give you a, a an endowment of say 20 shocks and says, well, you and this other person uh, together have to take these 20 shocks. How do you want to divide them up? Um, this is a study from Roberta Weber and colleagues, and this is a study I did uh, with colleagues in, uh, at UCL. And what these kinds of experiments have shown is that when people have to exchange pain with other people, they generally share equally. Um, so the most common uh, offer, so to speak, in both of these experiments is the 50-50 split. So behaviorally, there's not a lot of evidence supporting this second hypothesis. Um, but what we wanted to do was to go to the brain and see if we could find neural representations of these two quantities and, and, and probe whether um, either of them actually uh, could predict behavior. And so um, within the context of our model then, um, is it that this uh, pain, delta S, is being weighted more in the values uh, for others than for self? Um, or is it that the profits gained from harming others are weighted less in the value um, than the profits gained from harming self? And as I said earlier, it's very difficult to resolve this just from looking at people's behavior. And this is where neuroimaging can be a very powerful approach because basically what we can do is we can take um, this model and across our, our set of trials, um, calculate a set of values and match those against neural responses to those same values, and then look to see whether there is a correspondence between uh, model values and representations in the brain, and correspondingly whether, whether any one of the components of this model can then predict choices in the task. And so that was, that's, what's we've, that's what we've done. And what's also very exciting about this approach is that it doesn't actually require that these representations in the brain be localized to any one area. One, one real challenge um, that cognitive neuroscience has faced since its inception is this problem of reverse inference, where we know that brain areas like the amygdala are reliably associated with, say, uh, fear. But because the amygdala is also associated with positive emotions, we can't infer from amygdala activity that someone's feeling afraid, they could be feeling other things as well. Because the model-based approach uh, makes specific predictions about the trajectory of responses in these brain regions, um, we can simply ask, is there anywhere in the brain that's showing a stronger response to pain for others than for self and also predicts choices, or likewise, is there anywhere in the brain that's showing a reduced responses to money gained immorally uh, versus morally and also explains behavior? Nevertheless, there are areas that we would expect to see these responses. So um, as very nicely prefaced by the talks earlier today, um, Hundreds of studies now have shown uh, that pain uh, is, is, is represented in the anterior cingulate cortex and the insula, and uh, money reinforces are represented in medial prefrontal cortex and striatum. So we can, we can make uh, a priori hypotheses about where we would expect to see these signals in the brain, but I just want to emphasize that the ability to address our psychological question, which is what's driving this behavior, actually do, uh, doesn't require observing localized responses anywhere. So um, we brought participants into the scanner and they're making choices. Uh, and this, uh, this is a similar uh, task from before. So uh, sorry, that's not very visible, but uh, less money, less pain, more money, more pain. Um, across our trials, we are independently varying the amounts of money at stake and the amounts of pain at stake so that we can tease apart the brain signals that are related to money and pain as people are making these decisions. Again, we see this moral preference where people um, are uh, on average requiring more money to harm the other person um, than themselves. And um, Again, we see this nice distribution of, of preferences and, and the individual variability is really helpful because we can capitalize on this to then ask the question, well, 
are the people who are showing the strongest moral preferences, um, showing differential responses to money or pain um, as, as, we, uh, as we had identified earlier. So our model, to recap, suggests that choices are made on the basis of a value signal that integrates the costs and benefits of profit and pain. And based on prior work, we would expect to see a subjective value signal in the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, in the striatum, uh, posterior cingulate cortex, and so on. Um, that's the case uh, in our study as well. So these red areas are, are areas that, uh, whose response correlates positively um, with the, the, the subjective value of the chosen relative to the unchosen option. Um, now the key question, of course, is does this value signal reflect the moral preferences? Um, and if so, we might expect, um, particularly uh, responses in this region, um, to show a weaker response to the value of the harmful option when it's for the other person um, compared to when it's for the self. Um, and that's indeed what we find. So if we take this value-sensitive region and then just plug in the values of the harmful option, um, when it's for the self uh, versus the other, then we show a reduced response in this region, which uh, should correspond to the fact that people are actually choosing the harmful option less than for the other person. Now, this is the integrated value signal, but what we're really interested in is the neural representations of those components of the value signal, the profit and the pain. So turning to our first question, one reasonable hypothesis might be there may be regions like insula or perhaps TPJ that are strongly representing um, pain for the other person relative to the self and correlate with moral behavior. Um, so what we did is we basically uh, regressed the individual differences um, in choices um, onto a brain map that's looking at uh, differences in the response to uh, the pain quantity for others relative to self. And in our first look across the whole brain at a relatively strict threshold, we, we don't find um, anything, we don't find any areas that are responding more strongly to pain in others than pain for self and also correlate with behavior. But we weren't satisfied with this, so um, we looked a bit further to uh, regions of interest. So um, I see Tanya smiling. <laughs> um, so we do see a, a response to pain um, in anterior cingulate and bi bilateral insula. Um, but if you extract from this region separately for other versus self, um, these regions are responding more to own pain than to others' pain. And if you take the difference um, between self and other responses in this region, um, it doesn't correlate at all with moral preferences. So the takeaway here is that there are regions in the brain that are representing the pain in these choices, but it's not that people who represent others' pain more strongly um, than self also are willing to uh, choose to reduce that pain more. Um, a similar analysis um, for TPJ uh, has a, a complementary message. So the TPJ is actually the one area that does respond more strongly for pain in others than pain in self. But again, if you take the difference between that signal for other versus self, it doesn't predict moral preferences significantly. So that was interesting and not necessarily what we would have expected based on the literature. Um, so we next turn to this representation of money and this is of course where things get interesting. Um, so we do the same analysis where we're correlating individual differences in moral behavior against a differential brain response to money gained from harming others versus self. And here we find a really robust response in a network that includes striatum, um, prefrontal cortex, um, and uh, insula. And essentially, um, what's happening in this area, um, this, is, this is from dorsal striatum. Uh, striatum is responding very strongly to money that you get from shocking yourself. So if you can get 10 pounds from shocking yourself, um, then this, this area is responding really strongly compared to if you could only get one pound, let's say. But the same region is insensitive to money you get from shocking the other person. 
So that's interesting, and we're, we're predicting moral choices on the basis of this, of this differential response. Um, the stronger this goes down, uh, the more likely you are to uh, show uh, uh, th this moral preference to require more money to harm the other person than yourself. Okay, so just to sort of conceptualize what we're seeing so far is that um, value-sensitive regions in the brain are responding more to money you get from shocking yourself than to money you get from shocking another person. So one question that we might ask is um, what happened to this value? Like wh where did it go? And one idea is that there's a sort of self-regulatory process where we're incorporating moral rules into the value representation and that's ramping down the striatal response um, to the ill-gotten gains in this case. So this leads to a specific prediction about how long people will take to make these kinds of choices um, if moral decisions involve an extra processing step where people have to incorporate a moral goal or a moral rule into their value representation, then people should take longer to decide when their choices affect other people compared to when they affect only themselves. And this is indeed what we find. So people are slower when, when their des decisions affect others and moreover, the extent to which they slow down um, predicts their moral preferences. So I think uh, the results so far kind of, um, kind of uh, square with, with observations uh, from uh, quite a long time ago. This is a quote from Adam Smith. Um, the question is, what is going on here? And an and idea that comes from, from philosophers like Adam Smith is that maybe what people are doing is they're sort of turning in, inward a moral judgment process. So um, Smith writes, the principle by which we naturally either approve or disapprove of our own conduct seems to be altogether the same w with that by which we exercise judgments concerning the conduct of other people. So the basic idea is that people are making moral judgments or anticipating the moral judgments that people might have about their own behavior. And we can think about where in the brain this might take place, and, and our prediction is that this is going to be taking place in lateral prefrontal cortex. There are lots of other studies uh, showing that lateral prefrontal cortex is engaged when we make moral judgments about others and when we comply with social norms. And lateral prefrontal cortex is anatomically connected with the precise area of striatum that we see to be sensitive uh, to the moral consequences of, of how money is earned. Um, so um, we wanted to test a couple of questions in our data. Um, during decisions, do we see activity in lateral prefrontal cortex that's consistent with a moral value signal? And if so, then do we see any interactions between lateral prefrontal cortex and, and striatum that are consistent with this story? So really the question is, when I'm making a moral decision, is my lateral prefrontal cortex representing an anticipation of the judgments of other people, how people might judge me if I took the selfish option. So to test this, we did something a little bit crazy, and I'm still, uh, I'm still kind of amazed that this worked. But we ran a separate behavioral study um, where instead of having people, um, or in addition to having people make um, the decisions, we had them do this moral decision task, um, the same task that participants did in the scanner, but um, we also had them do a blame task where instead of choosing between um, different amounts of money and pain, um, they're shown the choices of other people and asked, um, how much would you blame this person for, say, giving 20 shocks for a profit of 10p? And then what we can do is we can uh, build a model of blame and how people factor up money and pain when they're making moral judgments about other people. And what we find is, uh, is two things that are, that are pretty interesting. So um, kind of unsurprisingly, these are heat maps where more red is more blame. And here on the vertical is how much pain is being inflicted. And on the horizontal is how much money is being earned. Um, so basically, um, you can see in both of these maps that um, people get blamed for making choices that inflict a lot of pain for very minimal profit. So it's the 20 shocks for 10p choice that I, that I described earlier. Um, the other thing that's interesting is that um, this is a participant with a low moral preference, and this is a participant with a high moral preference. So 
blame judgments are more extreme, the more moral you are. So if you're making very moral choices, if you're uh, really averse to harming others for money, then you're going to judge others a lot more harshly for that. So once we had this model, um, then what we wanted to do is, OK, do moral judgments in this one group of people actually predict brain activity in the participants who were scanned? So when these people are making decisions, does their lateral prefrontal cortex actually represent the moral judgments of other people? And uh, the answer is yes, it does. So um, this region of lateral prefrontal cortex is showing a positive correlation um, with the amount of blame that other participants assign to uh, choices. And we tested a couple of alternative uh, explanations for, for this region. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, this idea about um, a break system where lateral prefrontal cortex might be just inhibiting self-interest, well, that model would predict that we would see more activity in this area uh, when people choose a helpful option relative to uh, when they choose a harmful option. Um, but that that contrast does not actually explain behavior uh, activity in this region very well at all. Um, it's, it's, it's equally active um, on trials where people choose the helpful and the harmful option, um, but regardless of what they choose, uh, the signal is, is really strongly correlated with how much blame other people would assign for choosing the, the harmful option. Okay, so finally, we want to ask whether there's increased, uh, a, a change in connectivity between lateral prefrontal cortex and the area of striatum that showed a reduced response to the ill-gotten gains. Um, so we did a connectivity analysis where we're looking at uh, communication between lateral prefrontal cortex and striatum um, during these moral decisions where they choose the helpful option for the other person um, relative to two controls um, when they choose the uh, helpful option for themselves um, and when they choose the harmful option for the other person. And here, um, we find a significant negative connectivity uh, when people make the moral choice. So the more activation in lateral prefrontal cortex, the less activation in striatum. This area of striatum that is functionally connected with lateral prefrontal cortex is a value-sensitive region. Um, so it's responding more to the value of chosen than unchosen options. And crucially, if you look at the response to money in this region, um, that's connected with lateral prefrontal cortex, um, the more that response goes down when you harm the other person, uh, the stronger your moral preference. So we're sort of completing the circle of this circuitry and identifying a mechanism where participants are representing moral values, imagined blame judgments of others um, in lateral prefrontal cortex, and when they make moral decisions, that region is negatively connected with striatum, which shows a reduced response to the money you get from harming other people. Now, this circuitry that we've identified is sensitive to dopamine. And so following on from the previous two talks, um, we wanted to look at whether artificially manipulating dopamine in, in, in this paradigm would, would change people's moral preferences. Um, so we gave people a single dose of levodopa, which is the chemical precursor to dopamine, um, and had them complete this, this paradigm. Um, and what we find is that on placebo, this is the white bar, again, people require more money to harm others than themselves, and that's abolished by levodopa. So here are the distributions. On placebo, majority of participants show the moral preference, and that's, uh, that's uh, sort of reversed um, in, in the group that got the drug. It's not just that any drug will have this effect. So we compared the effects of dopamine with a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, citalopram. This has a very different effect, just generally increasing harm aversion, both for self and for others. Um, but the serotonin drug has no effect on moral preferences. OK, so I'm just going to sum up now. Um, behaviorally, we find that people require more money to harm others than themselves and that moral transgressions uh, corrupt neural representations of value where the striatal response to money is reduced when that money is an ill-gotten gain. Um, and lateral prefrontal cortex uh, seems to uh, represent the moral value and show communication with this area of striatum. Um, so 
I'm just drawn to this quote um, by Adam Smith that I think sums up, sums up an aspect of our results. We know that empathy drives a lot of pro-social behavior, particularly um, for our friends, for our family, uh, for those that we interact with face to face. But this study, I think, is looking at something rather different, which is how do we treat strangers? How do we treat people who are abstract? And I think uh, what Adam Smith recognizes here is that um, reason, principle, conscien conscience, um, these sort of moral principles that we use to regulate our own behavior are a really, really important factor, um, particularly when we're dealing with, with those who are distant from us. Um, so final thoughts on, uh, on the neurobiology. Um, I won't go too much into the, the neurochemical side because we've heard a lot about that already. But if it's the case that a lot of moral behavior towards strangers uh, could be explained by a sort of prefrontal regulation of value, what do we know about the prefrontal cortex? Um, well, we know that it undergoes a period of pro a pro protracted period of development. It's not fully developed until the end of adolescence into early adulthood. Um, we know that it's disrupted by poverty and traumatic experience in childhood. Um, we know that its function is disrupted by stress. And um, finally, the, this area is a sort of general purpose, flexible way that, that we represent rules and goals. And so although most of us have goals that are in the service of helping other people, of, of following social norms, in certain situations and environments, other kinds of goals can take over. Um, and, and, and may explain how people are able to inflict harm in the service of uh, an idea or a, a notion that they're doing something actually good. Um, and so the, the last thing I'll show is just some, some new data um, touching on this idea of whether anticipating doing something good can actually counteract the reduction of value that comes from harm. Um, and there's, there's some initial evidence that um, people can launder money with acquired negative value. People are, uh, who get blood money from wrongful death suits, for example, are more li likely to donate that to charity and so on. Um, we adapted our paradigm. Um, we, can, we compared uh, behavior in a, a condition where, again, people are inflicting pain on self versus other for profit. Again, we see this uh, majority of people behaving uh, morally. Um, but when we say um, you can give some of this money to charity at the end of the experiment, um, then we really wipe out the moral preference. So as soon as the benefit of harming the other person is for good, um, this moral preference totally reverses. We haven't scanned this yet, but my strong hypothesis is that this is also mitigated by the same prefrontal brain area. And if that's the case, then the very same mechanism that makes us avoid harming others for our own benefit could actually drive us to harm others for a perceived greater good. Um, so that's it. I'll, I'll just conclude there. And thank you for your attention.